works here, right? Um, so this comment, uh, so I, I, I read the reviews and to be honest, I don't read the, the first half where you summarize what the paper is saying. Um, because you know, I, I read the paper, right? So the opinions, right? So this opinion kind of stood out, right? Um, so I'm asking him to defend this opinion, but essentially he says, they do something with, with, with threads, but modern processors are, um, are small, are lightweight, right? So processors are lightweight, so we don't need to worry about threads, um, especially since Chrome uses processors, right? What, does, what, do, you, what do you mean by that? Well, so like you have, um, uh, like using Firefox or Internet Explorer when you open a new tab, it's mm -hmm. like a new thread. Mm -hmm. uh, but Chrome using like, uh, you know, processes instead of threads. Mm -hmm. So is something go wrong when you're processing a piece of code? It's not gonna crash it all. Wait, I, I, so yeah, so I'm saying going beyond that. Like, what do you mean by the whole notion, right? Why, why, um, it seemed like you were saying why bother with managing yeah. threads, so, right? I mean, uh, like you know. Maybe it's 10, 30 years ago, you know, memory is not that really like low. Mm -hmm. You have a small amount of memory. So like people using thread, you know, to be able to speed up the machine and, you know, take advantage of, you know, the parallelism of the computer. Mm -hmm. um, but nowadays we have like huge memory machines, so. And, you know, I mean, you're in thread either like in, you know, programmer perspective or like user perspective. Uh, it, nothing different. Like with you know processes, so you know you can do processes you know multi processes easier easier than uh, multi threads. So how many of you agree with that? How many of you disagree with that? How many of you wish you were in Cancun? <laughs> okay. I guess I. I mean, my argument is not very robust, but I just feel like anytime we say we have so much memory or speed available and so we don't really have to worry about it anymore, then that just leads to things getting out of hand and eventually mm -hmm. eventually, your lack of care will catch up with. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that that's an excellent point in general, right? One of the things that people who, I would argue, haven't thought it through clearly they do, they do this all this time, right? They say, okay, modern processors are fast, so let's not worry about it, right? I think the argument has to be modern processors are fast, so you don't need to worry about using an algorithm which is not as fast as possible because it gives us this other trade-off which makes it all worthwhile, long sentence, but basically not saying see, processors are fast, so let's, let's have um, poor implementation Right? Our processes are fast, so let's use an implementation which is which is slow but gives us other benefits. Right? I think what they really should mean is the second second case, not the first case. Where let's use a, a implementation. Right? Yeah. I, I think you can you can go you can beg off and say processes are fast enough when you only want to solve problems that you could solve with previous generation hardware by use by being mm -hmm. as exact as possible. Mm -hmm. However, the problem is that we don't want to just solve mm -hmm. the previous generation mm -hmm. hardware problems. We want to solve future problems which will require you to be as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. well, the, 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 those are excellent points. Right? So people are sloppy with their arguments and sometimes they say, oh, it, machines are faster, don't worry about it. But what they really should be saying are the people who, hopefully the pa people who write these papers that we read in the, the, in the, in the class are really trying to say is that part, right? So that's one argument. So the, what's the, uh, so how, so what is, what do you use threads for? What is, what is the use of threads? Yeah. Well, you can share memory. So it, it should be faster communication between, or it should, the, the, the process, the, the threads can share memory between them and so they can share data uh, as opposed to using IPC or something that should be theoretically slow. So is there a reason why the IPC uh, interprocess communication should be slower than threads? Actually, I would, very practical mm -hmm. thing, you know. In Linux, the threads basically just process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the thing. If we, the, the. It's yes and no, right? Yeah. So what are the yeah. one? So, um, so this gets into a specific operating system which I don't like to go because that depends on how much you understand that particular operating system, right? So Linux, they, they only have a concept of a kernel level thread. So task is basically depends on protection, right? So if you protect, 
your thread from another thread, it becomes a process, otherwise it becomes the same thread, right? But I think therein lies the problem, right? So why is an IPC slower than uh, inter-process communication slower than intra-process communication with the, with the thread model? You need context switches back and forth. You need context switches, you need a protection change, right? You need to go from one to the other, so that's the one which kills you, not necessarily the, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a memory in the same machine, but you have to kind of go from one application context to another context, and that is very expensive, right? So Linux would still have the same kind of problem, right? Um, so, so why did we study threads? I mean, we didn't study threads here, but in undergrad, they probably taught you threads, right? So what is the one reason why you wanted that? One is like you can access your shared memory faster. Yeah? More optimal scheduling. If you can schedule your threads in user space, you should be able to pick, <clears throat> make better special purpose decisions than a more general operating system group. Okay, so the, the, those, those are two variants of a thread, right? Yeah, th th that's that's one thing this paper talks about, but in general, why did we study about threads? Yeah? Maybe uh, more parallelism with little cost than processes. Uh, expand on that? Sorry? Expand on that? Uh, I mean, uh, for, for the user level, mm -hmm. when we have, say, like a multiprocessor system, mm -hmm. and we need more parallelism on the application level, mm -hmm. and we don't want to incur the cost of different processes for that, mm -hmm. then threads may be of use. How many of you agree with that definition of threads? Yeah. I guess I just agree. I mean, it seems like we, when, when you're in the... Um, so I mean, if you have if you had a lot of processes, then you're having to worry about the kernel is going to have to schedule them all using its method, which is just kind of the same problem that the authors of this paper were trying to mm -hmm. get around. Of the mm -hmm. different management schemes might be better suited to different applications. So if you let each application decide how to manage its own parallelism, you're probably going to get better performance. Mm -hmm. But, but that, I think that's the argument that he was also bringing up, right? So that's the issue of once you buy into threads, how we can implement threads is, you know, one of them, you can do it on the application level, one of them, you need the kernel support, right? But I think his, his, his point was, if you have um, multiple threads in the same, same process, and if you're on a multiprocessor machine and you want to use parallelism, Threads are a better way to go than processes because say you're operating on a large matrix, right? And if you have multiple threads, then it's not more easier and natural to operate on them with multiple processors assigned to you for each thread, right? Right? That's the reason why you should have been taught that we need threads, right? That's one of the reasons why you want. So there are two reasons why you want threads. If you want application level parallelism, Threads is a, it's the only way where you can get multiple CPUs to the same process, right? Right? So if you want, if you want to have write parallel programs, one of the paradigms that you can use is use threads, or you can use multiple processes, then you have to worry about this inter-process communication and things, the, the performance goes down. So really the only option for you to work on if you want performance and if you have multiple processes, process source, and if you want to assign all of them to a single process and you want to do something, threads are the only way to go, right? And, and threads also help you in writing asynchronous code because if you want to write a code which is not parallel processing, but if you want wait for I.O. and you don't want to deal with the things to stop, you want to proceed, right? Can you think of an uh, application which can benefit from threads on a normal machine? So in your desktop that you have, what is an application that you think could benefit from threads? Yeah? Like uh, when we need a text editor? So text editor, right? Um, can you think of another application? Text editor, PowerPoint, the Microsoft Office, right? Um, anything with the GUI. Anything with the GUI, right? Because if you have event program, each event can be done, dealt with a different one, right? So another example is a web browser, right? Web browser can have multiple things going on. It can be getting something from the network through multiple connections, rendering something over there, right? So, multi so thread browsers can be multi-threaded. 
if you have multiple processes, to use the multiple threads to get make it look like you're you're getting good performance. You know, one thread can be doing one thing. So if you have four processes, potentially you can have four threads doing different tasks for you, right? Now he brings up a, you bring up, bring up an issue that uh, Google does something, right? I mean, the Chrome creates processes for different tabs. Is that conflicting with what I just said? What, right? I'm saying if you have threads and if you have multiple processor, your web browser can be made faster because it could potentially do four things at the same time. It can be rendering something on, on one thread, it can be downloading something, it can be doing something else for you on the four all at once. But then the points you mentioned are also valid, right? So if one of them crashes, you can also run the other other process, right? Yeah. It doesn't conflict with what you said, but if there's a lot of communication between the four processes, then process first threads will be more more of an overhead. So, so what do you say it doesn't conflict? Well, so if it does conflict, I mean, you need to, if you're taking the data from the network and giving it to the renderer, mm -hmm. then you might have a problem if you've got to do that communication mm -hmm. between processes as opposed to threads. Mm -hmm. I, I think it does not conflict because you could still run multi-threaded in each tab, right? Each process can be multi-threaded and you can have four, so if you use Google browser, if you have three tabs, each tab can use four threads, and you can still get the benefit of both, right? Tab meaning like you can get the four processor. So four threads for a tab means each tab can potentially get the four processors, and then once you have the four processors, you can have three different processes, right? Which all kind of coexist, so you can get the best of both of them. If one of them crashes, the others don't, are not taken down, and you can still get four processes, right? Four processors to a single process. And one of the things is that you said nowadays, right? So nowadays systems have a lot of memory. So what else also, what, what other thing has changed these days compared to some day in the past? What is another trend? What, one trend is machines are, have a lot more memory. What's the other significant trend that you probably notice? Yeah. I think I mentioned, yeah? Multi-core. Multi-core, right? So with multi-core, does it make sense to use threads or not to use threads for a browser, let's say? Uh, yeah, yes, I mean, so you can utilize your uh, one processor's per thread. Mm -hmm. So you can take the mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I, I actually think that I disagree with your comment because I think that in the modern processors, threads are even more valuable than they were before, right? Because most machines you can buy, other than if you buy iPhone or something like that, right, are multi-core, right? And the future is towards multi-core because we're not, I mean, the hardware is not letting you go to 10 gigahertz processor on your desktop, right? So the only thing that Intel and other companies can do in the future is to have more cores, not make the core faster, right? So if you came into the computing world around 2000, you will notice that every uh, month or so the processor speeds are going up and up and up. But they kind of plattered out because at this point, you, you can't really make them go faster, but you can build more cores. So the future is towards more cores, which means that the future is towards threads, right? Our future is you have to support applications which can take, use all the different processing elements, right? Of course, Hello World will never be multi-threaded because that's, that's not, not, not the application you would want, but in the future. So I think that looking at the threads is a lot more valuable now than before. Does that, do you agree? You have to disagree because you, that's your... Yeah, this is my opinion, I just don't like threads. That's a different point, right? I'm not asking whether you like threads, right? So why don't you like threads? Yeah, so that's, that's, that's a valid concern, and that's one thing that Intel would agree with you, right? Intel would, would very enthusiastically agree with you. In fact, they're putting up lots of money to solve that problem, right? So if you, if you read the popular press, I think Intel is giving like $150 million to Urbana Shopping and other schools to make threads useful because if you don't have threads, right, all the cores mean nothing, right? So I can have 10 core machine, and I can run 10 different processes to get the benefit of those, but a single process cannot use those, right? Most of us try to run a single process all the time. So when you talk about Word, right? Very rarely people 
work on Word and PowerPoint and something else simultaneously at the same time, entering keys and all the different stuff. You're either entering in Word, then going to PowerPoint, then going to Photoshop or something. So you're going to see performance benefits only if you use threads, whether you like it or not, right? So I, I, that's, that's an exact, entirely valid point. And, and, and till now, it's, it's been very hard to program. And it's slowly coming on, but that's, that's a serious concern, right? But I also argue that we don't have a choice, right? We have to figure out how to solve the problem because we have multiple processors, we wanted to give it to the users, and the only abstraction we know sort of is, is threads. Of course, you can use events, and which is sort of the same. You know, that one of the papers said they're sort of equivalent. You still have the same issues of... So that's why one of the reasons why we're kind of spending a lot of time on, on this kind of stuff, right? Right? Do you have any other... No, I mean, it, it, it's, it, it's, it's not a solution, you know, it's not an end all, right? So if any of you have programmed in real threads, real applications, you will realize the, the, the pain of what these people have been talking about. Some of the previous papers we talked about said the same thing, right? It's easy to write thread program if you can put the whole thing in a monitor, right? If you can put the each thread into a monitor, but only one thread can run at any one time, then it's easy to program it, right? But then you get performance of 1x. If you want to have 10x performance, you have to let them go all at once, right? And for many of us, thinking of what will happen when 10 threads are doing something, right? It's very hard, right? It's very easy to, it's relatively easy to think of what each instruction is doing. So like if you take your undergrad programming, you know, programming 101 or something, right? They tell you that, okay, first this line goes, then this line goes, then this line goes, then this line goes. So you kind of follow along what your logic is, you kind of do what, what's going on. When you have threads, and if it's really doing what it's supposed to do, you have to say, while I'm doing this, this thread could have been either moving forward or backward or, or should be, could be here. So all 10 of them are kind of going around. So it's, it looks like a, um, another example of a toddler running around and trying to, you're trying to make sense of it. I mean, all these threads are going around and trying to make sense out of it is not a trivial task, right? Um, but we are kind of forced into solving those, right? And let's see. Sean said. Yeah, I just put something this morning. Yeah, he said um, something about multiprocessor and multicode, right? Yeah, that's a very weak definition, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, probably a multiprocessor is two kind of, a, you know, shared memory or distributed memory. Mm -hmm. And some people call might cross or multiprocessor, so that's where it's... We will, we will read some of those papers. So one of the uh, points it, I think he's trying to bring up, we'll see in the future, I think we'll see a paper after fall break, right? So th this, this is the idea of... This gets into the de details, right? So if you have a CPU, if you have a CPU, right? Some abstract notion of CPU, and you have memory, and you have memory, and you have... You traditionally tend to have some sort of a memory which is closer to some things, and some sort of memory which is further away from something. And you have memory hierarchy that you probably uh, learned in early, early classes where registers are faster than caches and fa caches are faster than main memory and so on and so forth, right? But you tend to have something of this nature where the details are how are they connected, right? So it may be possible that these two are connected and these two are connected and from them there is some sort of a connection going here, right? And then you kind of figure out how long this is, right? Because the length matters because the physics, you know, the speed of light gets into the picture. So you have to figure out how what happens, right? So this is one millimeter, this is one millimeter, and this is, say, one millimeter or something. I'm just throwing some number, right? Then the same CPU, CPU memory behaves one way. And if you change it from one millimeter to one kilometer, right, or one meter, if you change these things, right, things change because once these things become bigger and bigger, 
you give it different names too. You call it distributed systems and, and what have you. But essentially, you get into points where reaching something here is faster than reaching something here. Right? And this is called NUMA, uh, non-uniform memory access kind of thing. So you get into all these issues. right? So I may prefer to keep something closer to me because speed of light says that I cannot go, I, you know, it takes a certain amount of time to reach something, right? And also they have to worry about contention issues, which is one thing we'll kind of uh, stumble into, which is the idea here that if this is how this was organized, they both are sharing this bus, right? Which means that if something is asking for a page here, you may not be able to request it at the same time. It still thinks of going at breakneck speed, but we are talking about even break, more breakneck speed for the processor, right? The processor is going really fast. You need to worry about all those stuff, right? The other thing you worry about is what is the bandwidth out of the processor to this bus? What is the bus speeds and all those things, right? So in, in a modern desktop, um, I think that the newer um, Intel's, this is one, one million, one, one megabit, no, one megabit, I think one gigabit or something, right? The, the front side bus, the um, FSB for the processor, right? So it has a, some kind of bandwidth limitation on how it can get things out of the processor. Then you need to worry about what this, the PCI bus or whatever the processor is. And going within the CPU box, when you have multiple cores, depending on how they build it, right? If they build it where the cores don't talk to each other, <coughs> then you get certain kind of performance. But if, you, if the CPUs can directly talk to each other, then they have different performance, right? So multi-processor and multi-core can potentially be good or bad depending on how these things are set up, right? And that gets into a lot of detail which a lot of people have to worry about because that's how you get the maximum performance. So that's why if you ever follow the hardware stuff, people would say, well, AMD is a better multi-core than Intel or vice versa, right? I mean, different, different uh, generations because of how these things are set up, right? Right, so that's, that's, that's one, one important thing and it's very hard to figure out what happens because it's very involved. It doesn't really matter for Hello World program, but for real programs it matters because it, it, it affects how the performance happens. Right? The other thing to remember is processes are getting faster and faster, right? but the buses are not getting any faster and the speed of light is definitely not changing. Right? So you're kind of stuck with these things are slow compared to this one. So if you make the processor faster and faster, um, if you have a, if you if you hit the bus, right, you have to wait. Even if you have to wait for one instruction in the bus cycle, that could be equal to thousands of instructions in the CPU, right? So if it has to ever hit one byte from here, it could be it have to wait like a few hundred instructions on the CPU. So it becomes much more and more important, right? We'll we'll look at that a little bit of that. Uh, in the future classes, but yeah, that that's that. Okay, if you meant that one, yeah, it, it's it's pretty complicated because of the uh, different hardware, different architectures, and, and stuff like that, right? It, it it it's it's a it's a very hard problem because if you want to have 64 processors, right, you have to keep them apart at a certain space because they are running very hard. So you have to keep them apart. So if you keep them apart, then the length goes up. So then your speed goes down and things of that nature, right? Um. Yeah, so who's Gian? Um. Yeah, so uh, who's GM? Um, so what do you mean by, I think it's also a good solution to some problems. What kind of problems? So I think you and somebody else had mentioned, right, that they, uh, they like the notion of virtual multiprocessors and virtual processors. Okay. And I think two of you like virtual processors, right? So what do you, what do you like about it? What do you mean? What What is a virtual processor in what they're talking in this paper? Yeah. yeah it's uh, opposite to the uh, physical one. Yeah. Yeah. So in this paper, what do they mean by virtual processor? So in this paper, they talk about assigning a virtual processor to a, uh, to a program, right? Yeah. 
So what is what do they mean by virtual processor? Mm. I think somebody else liked that thing too. I forget who it was, but so um, I, I guess anyone can take the answer question, right? So what is a virtual processor in in this paper context? Not yeah. So it kind of the 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 kernel allocates certain certain time slices and certain <coughs> processors to uh, to the process, but then the process itself gets to decide, but they're, they're sort of, they're just logical, it's not, so it, it says you get this many time slices maybe, but the, the process itself gets to decide what threads mm -hmm. are running in which slices, mm -hmm. and it gets to do all the scheduling itself. Mm -hmm. So I think that the notion of virtual processor is, it, they call it virtual processor, but I think it, they really mean slices assigned, slices of CPU assigned to your your thread, right? It's not as grandiose as virtual processor in the in the in the full scheme of things, right? They're, they're not assigning you a processor which is always available to you. They're just saying that this is the way for the kernel to give you processor. Yeah, yeah. We just, I mean, it's it's a processor allocation. They just give it a fancy name of virtual processor. Not necessarily. Um, they're not virtualizing anything. They they're just saying that we're going to allocate the processor to you once every five seconds. Let's say one second for every five seconds. We're just going to allocate it to you. But if you're going to call it a virtual processor that you run on, it's nicer to explain and stuff. But it doesn't do anything else, right? It it just allocates the processor to you, right? Um, so what, what, what do you think is a, is a uh, you said it's a good solution for some problems, right? Yeah. So can you think of some problems where this is a good solution? Uh, so you say that it, this is a good solution for some problems, right? Yeah. So can you think, what, what problems were you thinking where it's a good solution? Uh, uh, Parallel programs? Yeah. Okay. Um, Yeah, so so this this is really bent for parallel programs, right? Uh, is that all? I hope people read the reviews, right? Uh, yeah, so this this was I forget who said that. Uh, Okay, okay. So it said if the application programmer did not know how to write a good scheduler, this is this is this is the line of thinking. Um, I, I pointed this out because this is this brings up an interesting issue, right? So there's there's the issue of people like to say if you can solve the problem if you guys did the right thing, right? Well, whoever you are, right? I mean, uh, you're a compiler, you may be a hardware person, you may be something, right? So I can say I can solve all the problems in operating system if you uh, hardware guys could do a good job, and if you compiler guys did all the right job, then I'm, and new application developers did all your, what you have to do, then I can build this really simple thing, right? And it's annoying because you're basically saying, oh, you know, my solution depends on you solving the problem. And if you talk to the compiler people, they, they really would say, well, we can solve all the problem if you operating system guys can do what, what you're supposed to do, right? So everybody points fingers around and at, at the end somebody hurts, right? So it, it formed kind of in that vein. So here, one of the things that they try to do is they kind of push something up to the application, right? So kernel kind of says, if you can build a good application level library, then you're fine. And so I think the argument was you need a default. I mean, so what is the default? Like, you know. You could, so you could write an activation that if you had a virtual processor, a time slice, you could just, at each time, one thread was granted by the kernel or released, you could just activate the next thread in that. Mm-hmm. So. so let's let's look back at the defaults, right? So <coughs> what would you be, what would the default be if you have no threads? So if you have a system which has no threads, which is which really means there's only one thread, right? If you have, a, if you're not, if you're not a threaded program, that means you have one thread. In that system, how would you implement the the, the scheduler? 
which seems like a trivial thing. I mean, you just run that thing, right? So if you have, like, let's say, two threads, how would you build the default scheduler? Just, I mean, you just round robin with the activation. One thread finishes, you just activate the next one. It's on, and you didn't even time slice. <coughs> is that is that possible? Yeah. Well, you could have a priority queue, right? Where once the thread gets preempted, because it says that uh, if you only have one virtual processor assigned to you, then the uh, the operating system scheduler will send an event through that processor to you. And then you can just pick the, the schedule should just pick the highest priority thread to, to be run. Mm -hmm. But 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 their argument is if you don't if you as application level something, just don't want to deal with it, right? You just you don't want to do anything. You just want the kernel itself to do the task work for you, right? That that's that's my reading, yeah. right? So yeah. you don't want to do prior you don't want to maintain priority queues and all those things. I just don't want to do anything. I just want the kernel to work for me, right? Well, well then you just spawn off the kernel thread for every Right in your program, if you wanted that to, to schedule for you, right? Going beyond that, can you do anything at all? Can you have a default scheduler activation mechanism scheduler that can do anything at all? Join the threads together and run them sequentially? I think you cannot run them. Here's, here's my reason. You cannot run them because one of the things that they they really want to worry about is they don't want to know how you define threads in your application. If you want the kernel to provide a default thread threading mechanism, it has to be implemented at the application level because from the purity of the schedule activation purpose, it has to in, it has to inform somebody, right? It cannot inform the kernel cannot make a decision for you because kernel does not know the concept of threads. So you could potentially come up with an event-based system on top of schedule activation. So all schedule activation does is comes and tells you, hey, I'm going to take off a processor, do what you have to do, right? So you cannot build a default scheduler unless you have a notion of threads built on top of it. And that has to be, so you, they could give you a default library of sorts, which can implement whatever the like basic threads. But that cannot be part of the kernel. Do you agree with that? Because the argument's sake, I mean, they, they only look at the kernel side. The kernel side cannot define the policies that you have called threads, right? So even though they, they talk in terms of threads, all it does is it comes and tells you what this thing is. You may be a threads package, you may be something else that they haven't thought of that I'm going to take a processor, I'm going to give you a processor. Only communication is about what it's going to take off. What it means to you is up to you, right? So this mechanism itself cannot solve your thread problem. You have to build a thread library which will solve the problem. Of course, I mean, they could give you a thread library and, and be done with it. But it cannot be part of the activation, right? But it's also portable to any, uh, any uh, existing thread library, right? Because it said mm -hmm. that they had to make sure that any P threads or whatever library, that, or C threads, I think, mm -hmm. they were running on top of it had to work because they had binary compatibility. Mm -hmm. So, I mean... It, it, it also happens. has to work with non-threaded applications too. Right. Right? Because non-threaded application expects certain things and they have to work too, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but but some of them, they have to write the library code. But I'm saying, speaking like completely pedantically, right? That is not part of the schedule mechanism, because schedule mechanism only informs something. That something may have been written by them, but it's essentially them putting on the application library hat, writing the code which works with their stuff, right? Not, not. But wasn't their whole point that we have to give the power to the application level developers? Mm -hmm. Oh, but, but, but his point is if the application level developer does not want it, right? Oh. Then how do you provide a default behavior, right? I'm saying for default behavior, this cannot do it. It has to, they have to write the library, c library on top of it to give it to you, right? You cannot say, I don't want any thread library at all. I want schedule activation to be the one which provides service for me. Because all this does is it, it just tells you, um, you, you have event and it's up, somebody has to deal with that, right? But that's an excellent point because look, uh, too, far too often, um, Many of the papers will say, you know, you just push it to the other side, right? 
Yeah, so this was, this I didn't know what, what, what this meant. Uh, yeah, so this one says, by sophisticated time slicing mechanism, rule-based time scheduling, RF, RF, right? So I, I just meant that like uh, the three problems, they want it to uh, make the case for poor integration mm -hmm. in user-level threads built on top of kernel threads. Mm -hmm. These three problems could be avoided uh, if there are some uh, rules in the operating system mm -hmm. saying that, okay, one thread is uh, running a spin lock on a resource, so don't preempt that process right now. Mm -hmm. Instead, just wait or maybe count the number of other processes that depend on these mm -hmm. and take the decision based on that. So this kind of uh, like... Uh, so you mean like move, moving the policies into the kernel? Right. Right? So what is the cost of doing that? So so I'm reading this as when you're doing the time slicing, you dis you know that this thread is waiting on a spin lock, this thread is doing something, this thread is doing something. Then I have some set of rules which say, this is what I should do, this is what I should do, right? What are you doing in effect? Uh, I mean, apparently I just wanted to mention that like, they want to be taking or preempting a process that is mm -hmm. like a high priority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm doing a high priority thing and giving it to a low, low priority or just preventing from a priority thing and giving it to none. Mm -hmm. So just to prevent those scenarios, mm -hmm. we can just check before we preempt mm -hmm. that what is it doing. So, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think this is a, one of the uh, solutions, right? So, can you think of reason why this is not a good idea? Again, this should have been covered in undergrad class in terms of uh, I think if you look at the I mean the Silbershard's book, right? This is a short-term scheduler, right? What is one of the one of the goals of the short-term scheduler? How do you want your short-term scheduler to be? You want your short-term scheduler to be smart. You want your short-term scheduler to be intelligent. You want your short-term scheduler to be uh, robust. You want your short-term scheduler to be fast. You want short-term scheduler to be small. What 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 is the main criteria which defines when you're trying to do, do the time slicing, right? So this is the clock which goes off every so often, right? So you know, modern machines every sec, 250 times a second, your clock your processor gets interrupted, right? And it has to decide what to do, right? Yeah. You want it to be small, fast, and try to fill this too. Yeah, you want one of the goals is you want to keep it very fast and simple, right? So you want to do, so it's, it's a, cha so if you, if you don't make it, if you make it, if you have to do a test, right? If you have to say, is the processor on a spin lock, right? You have to realize that this go test is gonna be done every time it, it has to make a decision. And it makes a decision far too often, right? So if it has to make a decision, is this one spin locked, right? And if the, Expected cases, all processors are spin locked, then you do something. But if the expected cases, spin locks are rare, then this would kill you because you're doing this <coughs> test for something that's not being done, right? So yes, you can try to move it in there, but you also have to balance it with the notion that this thing happens more often, so you try to make it as simple as possible. This is one of the things that the, the whole scheduling uh, in the process and everything comes in, right? You don't want to make a complicated scheduling decision because it has to be done really fast because you know, this is all overhead, so you want to make it move faster, right? So you can make it complicated by having all this nice stuff, but really, since spin locks are not that common, you would, you would assume, it's better sent to the specific program. So um, in, in their parlance, you know, sending it to the application which, which does deal with spin locks and testing it there is better than doing it for every case, right? Because it's not, you would think it's not that common, right? So, yet another paper on, on user-level threads, kernel-level threads, and you know the, the same kind of issues that we are talking about, right? So, what is a user-level thread? People haven't answered. So, what is a user-level thread? Last one. 
Sorry, I forget your name. What's your name? What? What's your name? My name? Yeah. My name is uh, G. G, okay. So what's, what's the user level thread? What's the user level thread? You. User level thread. What is this paper about, right? What is a user level thread? Or what is a kernel level thread? What is a thread? So, so do you want to take the, so what's the user level thread? Um, user level thread is a um, thread which is running in uh, the application on top of the kernel. So kernel, and this is user, what is the user level thread? Okay. Three threads, okay. So what's the kernel level thread? Yeah. It's where the kernel does all the thread management and keeping track of which threads are running. So in the user level thread also you have the same thing, right? Our kernel level thread also you have the same things, right? Mm -hmm. So what really happens is where the decision is made, right? The user level threads, I mean, you have the same thread in your application regardless of whether it's user level thread or kernel level thread, but in user level threads, the decision of which thread goes on what CPU, right? Which they call it as a virtual processor, right? Because it's easier to talk about. <coughs> The mapping from this thread running on this one is done at the user level, right? Meaning from here you have, you kind of get two threads. So basically you say, um, I have access to two different processes, virtual processes. So I, I, I kind of schedule this thread should be running on this process, this should, thread should be running on this processor. This thread I'll run later on, whatever. So that decision is done at the user level. Kernel level threads, you you do the decision inside the kernel. You everything goes into the kernel. Kernel decides which one should be put on which processor, right? So what are the pluses and minuses of each approach? Why would you choose a kernel level user level thread? User level thread scheduler. Who wants to take it? Other usual suspects. Um, so what is, uh, uh, why? Sorry? They were saying that your user level performs better and kernel level have better functionality and so they were taking the So what, why, why do you get better performance for user level threads? Because it seems like if you have two processors and you have three threads, right? Um, unless you do some sort of magic, right? Let's say you have three units of work, right? And you have two CPUs, right? You kind of should take about three or two amount of time, right? Either by using kernel level thread or user level thread, right? So why would one be a better performance than the other one? But what's the magic which makes one, you claim that one is better performance than the other one? Sorry? Because you have to switch between the uh, user uh, to the kernel, like, mm -hmm. like if you uh, manage the thread in the user mode, mm -hmm. you have to do that. Yeah, so you're really trying to optimize not this part and not the CPU part, but the, the decision part, right? If you have to make the decision often, and if you have to cross back and forth, right, this will kill you. So if you're doing kernel level thing, the decision is being made inside the kernel on which of the three gets to be mapped to the, this two. But every time you have to do that, you have to cross the boundary. That 
it's a performance loss. Right? So the performance loss is not from running your code, but from this decision process, right? And why do they say kernel level threats can have better, what's the other one you mentioned, kernel level threats, what's the? Functionality. So what's the, what do you mean by kernel level has more functionality? What kind of functionality would the kernel level thread give that? So what, so what are the problems with user level thread? It, it's, it's clearly faster because it, it has, uh, the decision can be made faster. Name some of the problems that can, that can happen when you have user level thread, which is sort of the, the things which should be better for kernel level, right? Anybody? Okay. You don't really know which thread has been preempted. Yeah, so the, the problem is the user level, because of the abstraction, right? It does not know what's happening inside the kernel, right? It does not know what's going on inside the kernel. So it's trying to make the decisions on kernel's behalf, but it does not really know what's really going on, right? So if you kind of take, if the kernel decides to take away this processor, then you don't know about it, right? So you're trying to, you're, trying to, you're assuming that you still have two virtual processors and you're trying to make decisions and those could be potentially wrong, right? And the other thing is if you wait on a system call, if one of the threads tend to wait on a system call, that means if you had mapped it to this particular virtual processor, this would have blocked because it's, it's a kernel, kernel is blocking it. You as application user doesn't know that. So you think that this processor, this thread is available to you you don't know that something is being blocked by the kernel because you really have no communication with the kernel, right? The, the problem is you're trying to make as much decision as possible that the kernel should do, but you really don't have the knowledge because it's, the kernel is not telling all this stuff, right? The functionality is there in the kernel because kernel knows everything because it's the one which is deciding who should get a processor, who shouldn't get a processor. So it knows that I took the processor away, it just can't tell you, right? So you have a mismatch. It's fast but it does not know all the facts, so it can make mistakes. If you go all the way to the kernel, then it knows everything, so it can do the right thing, but you have to do this crossing, right? Which is not a good thing. So that's, that's the two ends of the spectrum that uh, they were trying to attack. So what is the scheduler activation? Clearly it's the same kind of system, right? So you still have these three threads. Hopefully that, that didn't change. Your program is the same. You still have the same two CPUs. What is the goal that you're trying to achieve? Yeah. Trying to give more <coughs> control over the scheduling to the user threads. So trying, they're trying to give more control over the scheduling to the applications, right? So how do they, how are they doing that? Through schedule activation, sorry. Uh, so what does schedule activation do? Why do we need a, a concept? Why do you need to write a paper for SOSP? Why can't it just tell the user stuff? What's the big invention here, right? So how do you tell something to the kernel? How does this tell something to the kernel? Anything to the kernel? System calls, right? So you do a system call, you do the stuff, right? So why can't you just do a system call from here? Why can't the kernel make a system call to your library and tell you what you want? Yeah? And the app calls are more expensive. Huh? Forget about this paper. I'm saying why can't you implement this as a system call? Why can't the kernel do a system call and tell you what you need to do? do? I mean, we, we know system calls, right? System calls, you, you make a system call, you go into the kernel and tell it what you want, and it gives service to you, right? So what's the big deal about this whole thing? I, I can solve this. Basically, I, invent, I, I implement a system call here, and they have the kernel call it, right? Is that it? So what does a system call do? System call, obviously system call goes from user to kernel, right? But why do we even call it something rather than calling a procedure? 
function, right? Why is, why is it not a function call? What, what does magic about system call as compared to a function call? This is the undergrad OS, right? Yeah. A function call doesn't have to change context. Yeah, you, be, you go from user to kernel, right? See, there's the user and kernel, right? So you're going from normal user to a supervisor mode, right? So you, you get, so you need more privileges to do stuff, you, right? Kernel can do most of the you as a user, user mode. So you can't just do a function call to it because you don't have the privileges to do all the stuff. You need to elevate your privileges to do what you have to do, right? So what would it take for you to implement a reverse can you use a system call this way? Not in the traditional sense, because you don't have access to the hardware interrupts. That would be it. You don't, yeah, you don't, yeah. So in the traditional sense, if you want to go back to the user level, right, then you lose the, 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 the context of, I mean, you lose the privileges, right? You become a normal user, so you can't just come back again. You become, you lose all the stuff, right? What's the other, other problem? which this one addresses, right? So I want to, I think, I think you kind of mentioned it, right? So I'm trying, so that's one problem. Like how, what do you, what do you do with the privileges and all those things, right? So let's assume that we're trying to solve, we somehow solve the privilege problem that you can kind of go from here to here, right? What is the other problem that you run into? How is the system call implemented in uh, real systems? So you have a syscall table, right? When you do a system call, that's a hardware operation. That's not a function call. So when you call a system call, the you get a in, in, the kernel get an exception, right? The, basically, the hardware gives a signal to the processor saying somebody is trying to invoke system call number 43, right? And the kernel has to look inside itself and say, okay, 43, oh, that's read. So I'm going to call the read function to do what you have to do, right? System call really works that way, right? You don't make a, when you, when you say make a system call, it makes, it's, makes it sound like I just call a system call, but what I, what I do is I say I want to call system call number 43. I don't say I want to call system call number, system call read, I say I want a system call number 43. So the hardware has to give uh, exception, saying somebody's trying to run a protected, protected mode switch thing with the number 43. And you have to find out what the table is and then run it, right? So if this table and the system call, what you think is different, then bad things happen, right? If you, if you reconfigured your Linux machine and mocked up this table where this 43 happens to be open and your application is still calling 43 as read, then really bad things happen. But so you need to have this table which multiplexes what you ask to what is here, <coughs> right? It's a fact, right? So uh, move on. So how would you do that here? So first we have to solve the issue of what to do with the privileges. Let's say we somehow magically solved it. What is the next thing we need to do? We need to build this table, right? Some sort of a table to, to kind of contact back, right? So if you build this table, will that be enough? I mean, not necessarily because who should, I mean, someone would have to pull for the messages, which thread should look at the message. There are multiple processes, right? There are multiple people who are dealing with this stuff. I mean, when you talk about a single, when you talk about a kernel, most machines, or all the machines that I know of, have only one kernel, right? So when I do a system call, there's only one thing which looks at this table and figures out what to do, right? But when you have it the other way, there are multiple processes here, right? There are multiple, so the kernel cannot just call into something, it has to know something. So it's it's a little bit more complicated than just reversing the way system call works. System call works a certain way because you 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 raise your privileges, hardware helps you in giving an interrupt, and only one person is supposed to deal with that, whereas the other way things are different, right? So that's the sort of the context of why you can't just put a system, reverse system call, why you have this notion of an up call, right? Which is essentially what you're trying to do, but it's not, as trivial as a system call, because system call is kind of pretty because of the way things happen, right? So how does the scheduler activation work? What is activate? What is a uh, activation? What's what's the what's the 
what 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 this this concept you know what the functionality is trying to achieve it's trying to achieve the goal of something here wanting to communicate with something over here right how do they do that so they create this activation record right so what is this activation Activation always block? Uh, it, it is used to deal with blocks. It's used to deal with blocks, right? What, 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 what is the functionality that it does? The kernel creates an activation record, right? I mean, the paper talks about what kind of things go into the record. So I think schedule activation, activation is basically a, a form of a thread that that the the system supports, where you create this thread at the kernel level, and then you give it to the user level, right? You make this up call, but there are certain properties which makes which we'll will will talk in a little bit. But essentially, this kernel thread can now become a user level thread or whatever, right? So the way I give a processor to application is I don't give a processor. I create a thread in kernel space, and I give it to you. And when I give it to you, it becomes a user level thread in which you can schedule whatever you want, right? So I create a new process by creating, I, I, I give you a, a processor by creating a kernel level thread and making the kernel level thread into a user level thread so you can schedule whatever you want. I take it away from you by taking away the activation record from you. Is that your understanding of how things work? So to implement that, they have two stacks, right? They have a kernel level stack and a user level stack. So when I'm in the kernel space, I have to use a certain stack. When I'm in the user level space, I, I do a certain stack. And when I say I give you a processor, I give you this activation record, and you can run processes on top of the activation record by basically instant running what, whatever you want on it, right? So I don't assign processes to you. In the concept, conceptually, I want to give a processor to you. I don't give a processor to you. I give you this activation record, which is essentially a kernel thread, which will potentially become a user level thread. So I, this is how I give a processor to you, right? And they go through a lot of optimizations, which, which is nice. I mean, once you have this thread, you can schedule things on it. When you, th when you have things blocked, you can do certain things. You can do handoffs, the like continuations between users, applications, and contacts, and all those on the optimizations. But at the basis level, they assign a processor to you by giving you a kernel thread, which they call activation, because it can become a kernel to a user level. It can become whatever inside the kernel to something in the user level, which you can do whatever you want with it. Does that make sense? Is that a cool idea? What's the idea here? <coughs> I think the idea here is previously you always ask the kernel for something, right? And the kernel does whatever you want. The idea here is now you're entering a partnership, right? Where the information does not only flow from the user level to the kernel level, now you're also having the kernel level a way for the kernel level to communicate back with you. Addressing the issue of protection, all those things. So they, the paper deals with a lot of things about how activation records can be used for um, threading. We'll, we'll see a little bit of that. But I think the larger context is this is a nice way of exporting something from the kernel, right, back to the user level, right? Does that sound familiar? What's the, what's the, why is it familiar? It's like the XOR. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. Kernel? The kernel. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's sort of the same problem they're trying to solve, right? I mean, not, it's not the same, because obviously the paper came afterwards, so they won't know what exokernel is. Um, but it's the same sort of problem, right? You can go from kernel to application. If you have clear demarcation where 
the application knows something about the underlying stuff, it can do certain things, it can optimize certain stuff, but kernel always has something better. So you have to go that way, right? But it's good to leave the stuff in the application level, right? So they're trying to strike a balance on, they're trying to make the things that are possible at the application level more, so you don't have to cross as much, right? So they're trying more intelligence into here because they're, they're telling you all the stuff that the kernel needs to say to you. The rest of the stuff you can run. So there are only certain operations that I need to tell you the, which, which they list in the first uh, table, right? So only for those, I'll, I'll let you talk to you. Otherwise, I won't talk to you. So you, you can still get the good performance as you want uh, and talk, you know, have the kernel talk back to you, right? It's a revolutionary concept because Traditionally, kernels don't talk to you. You ask the kernel for something and it'll do what you ask it. It never talks back to you. It never you know, uh, calls back to you because it's, it has to do all the, the issue of uh, uh, protection, all those things. But in general, kernels do what it are told to do. And here they're, they're talking back to you. Except kernels solve it in a different fashion, but they're all in the same kind of notion of somebody knows more about stuff, how do we export that, right? So the, the, the question is, can you use this for anything else beyond threads? Can you use it for this? Can you use it for st other stuff, right? Can you export stuff back to the, the user space, right? And the answer has to be yes, because the, the exokernel takes it in, in that direction, but, but the, the whole idea of moving it back and forth, and the real challenge is trying to find the point where you don't, I mean, find the, the, the sweet spot where, where things are, um, the, the find the sp sweet spot where the stuff that needs to be in the user level, stays in the user level, stuff that needs to be done at the uh, kernel level has to be in the kernel level, right? What has to stay in the kernel level in this context? What, what, what is the absolute minimum that has to stay in the kernel level that cannot be exported to the user level? Name one, one stuff that Whatever you do, you can never give it to the application level. Scheduling. Yeah, the scheduling a processor to your process, right? It, you can only give a virtual process, you can do whatever, but to remove a physical process from your uh, processor from your application, right? That affects the system's uh, well-being, right? You cannot let one application take all the processor. So you have to <coughs> leave the the, the system, the, the things that make the system run with the kernel, right? So you want to make sure that the, only the kernel can decide whether you get a processor or not. You get to do what to do with that processor, that's up to you, and they, they, they do a, a good job with that. So again, the, 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 you know, some of the issues are, you know, if you have a user level thread, you get excellent performance because you don't do this crossing, right? There is no magic here. The thing which kills you is the, the, the reason you have to jump across the, the boundary, right? If the boundary crossing has no cost, then you can go as fast as, I mean, it essentially uh, it's a mute point. And the reason why it's not, uh, you can go fast because when you have to do this stuff, you have to save the context, right? You, know, you are going from user level to kernel level, you have to save your context. They do some optimization where they save the records, they give the records back to you, so you can do some sort of continuation style go directly into the application where you want to go back. But essentially, going from user to kernel, you have to do certain things to, to maintain the safety of the system, right? And you have to sort of figure out which application to, which uh, functionality to do through this, uh, you know, syscall tables or whatever. And those things tend to be slow because they, there's hardware involved in all those things, right? Um, and the, um, and the, and the, and the problem with, with the, um, Kernel level threads or kernel level threads have to solve all kind of problems. It, it, it's an abstraction for all kind of users. So if you wrote an application, which goes back to one of, one of your concerns, right? If you wrote an uh, application which only needed two functionality of threads, you still pay the whole price if you run the kernel level threads, right? And <coughs> so, you know, optimization is a good thing. Is that still relevant now? Is that one of the modern processor stuff, right? Is the overhead of, um, a general kernel level thread, is that still a problem? One of the things I learned from Wikipedia is, you know, the schedule activation, activation is being replaced by um, 
not the the uh, non-scalar so one-to-one um, -one kernels, right? Because 